like in uh, many countries in the world, uh, the United States, uh, the response to the COVID emergency was mixed. In some areas, we did very well. And I think the obvious one is vaccine development. Uh, our, our, our federal government funded vaccines by several companies, including Moderna, maybe some of you have even received. Um, and and uh, the US government funding and the US uh, scientific infrastructure really allowed uh, almost a miracle to happen with how quickly the vaccines were developed and how many lives were saved by that those vaccines, millions of lives, uh, the best estimates were saved by these vaccines. But the U.S. also had some uh, notorious failures. And the first one was very early during the pandemic. So you remember that the, the pandemic was really first recognized as a local outbreak in China in December of 2019. But by January, it was clear that it was spreading internationally cases have been detected in many countries, and I think most epidemiologists understood by late January that this was going to become a pandemic. And so, uh, of course, the, the, the first response needed was diagnostics. And uh, many countries adopted the WHO uh, PCR-based diagnostics that have been developed, I would imagine, here in Colombia. They were probably used. But in the U.S., sometimes uh, our, our scientific community and our government tends to be a little bit arrogant. And uh, so our Centers for Disease Control decided we're not going to use the WHO. We're going to develop our own PCR protocol, which is going to be better, and we're going to use that throughout the United States. So they, they quickly developed uh, PCR protocols. And they manufactured the reagents right at the Centers for Disease Control, which is not a manufacturing organization. It's not set up with the same kind of quality control as you would find at a pharmaceutical company. But nevertheless, they developed an assay. And at the beginning, all samples had to be sent to Atlanta, Georgia for testing. Um, if we had a suspected case in Galveston, where I work, there was no local testing available. The shipment to Atlanta took place, and then you had to wait a long time for a result. Uh, of course, everyone recognized that that was not going to be sufficient, and so the CDC's tests were distributed to state health laboratories around the country. And when, when those state health laboratories started running more tests, several of them noticed that they were getting false positives from their controls. And it was pretty clear very quickly that there were contaminants in those reagents that are getting false PCR positives. Uh, so, but unfortunately, the federal government hadn't even provided an option for other laboratories to develop their own diagnostics or even to implement the WHO diagnostics. So uh, the United States was caught completely blind to the spread of COVID for several weeks starting in late January. And uh, once it was recognized that the CD test was defective, uh, commercial laboratories, uh, academic and big hospital laboratories were permitted to develop their own tests, but they had to be authorized by the Food and Drug Administration. And so to do that, you had to show that your test functioned with RNA derived from the virus. And uh, until in late January of, of 2020, there were no samples of the virus anywhere in the country. Um, very quickly, when cases occurred in Washington state, the CDC uh, did make isolates of the virus and they distributed those isolates to five different laboratories in the country. And one of them was to our reference center. And so uh, we did some very uh, basic, not very interesting, but very important work early on in the outbreak in February. And that was simply to take those isolates to propagate lots of virus, to extract and qualify the RNA, and to send it to about 400 different diagnostic laboratories in the United States very quickly. And for almost one month, we were the only laboratory in the country that had access to that RNA that the Food and Drug Administration wanted to see to authorize the test. Later on, they dropped that requirement. But uh, so for, for a few weeks, um, our main job was just to make lots of viral RNA uh, and, and to, to provide it to validate with the Food and Drug Administration these new PCR tests. 
And so looking at the timeline here, um, you can see that uh, the first case was diagnosed in the US on the 20th of January. Uh, we received the virus isolate in, uh, on February 6th. We started to distribute viral RNA internally in our campus four days later. And then we, we uh, developed the right uh, regulatory forms, material transfer agreements very quickly with the CDC and started distributing that virus less than two weeks after we received that ISIL. And, uh, and then we just distributed RNA shortly after that. So during the month of February, it was a very frantic time for us, but I think that um, by the end of February, uh, independent diagnostic labs were starting to gain permission. And when the, the country was starting to recover from literally not knowing where COVID was, where it was spreading, uh, having no ability to implement public health measures in the most important locations to do that. So the second uh, challenge that came along was vaccine development. And as I said, vaccine development is one of the good stories of COVID. But uh, it happened with a lot of different groups providing a lot of different support for these companies like Moderna and Pfizer. And uh, one of our strengths at UTMB is in reverse genetics or RNA viruses. Uh, the RNA viruses, like I work with uh, alpha viruses and flavy viruses, but also coronaviruses. So we had uh, virologists like Dr. Vinit Matacheri, who had worked with coronavirus clones in the past. SARS CoV 1 in the past, but they were able to help us very quickly develop a cDNA recipe system for the virus. And this was important for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and I'll explain several of them this afternoon to you. But the first one was to try to help uh, with testing the clinical trial samples. So remember, Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson Johnson. They had to vaccinate uh, typically 20 or 30,000 people in their phase three trials to show efficacy for emergency approval in the United States. To occur. And so that means uh, 100,000 neutralization tests had to be done on the serum of these people repeatedly after vaccination uh, to get those approvals. And if you do tra traditional neutralization tests, some of you have probably done them, they're called plaque reduction neutralization tests. They're very tedious, they require a lot of cells, long incubation periods, manually counting plaques. Uh, that would have taken a, an awful lot of time and money to do that. So the first um, advantage of developing this reverse genetic system was in the serology. But this is basically how it worked. Uh, this was the first uh, reverse genetic system published uh, worldwide, and uh, it was done by and, and then cloning uh, different fragments of the coronavirus genome. Uh, The RNA can be introduced into cells through electroporation and the virus produced in this way. And so this cDNA clone uh, was made uh, in about three or four weeks after we obtained the first virus so very quickly and uh, validated and uh, put into use for several things. But the first one was for serology. And uh, now just being able to make the virus from uh, DNA or RNA doesn't really help you with the serology. But what does um, is the second step of this process, and that is to clone uh, into the genome a recorder, uh, such as green fluorescent protein or luciferase, that can be fused into the RNA genome 
and then expressed in infected cells to light up in infected cells when the virus enters. And so uh, this uh, reporter version was generated literally within about a week of generating the infectious cDNA all here. And it was used to develop very high throughput neutralization assays. So the way that those works is um, you would take this virus. This is a live replicating virus. So once the cloning is finished, you just work with the virus. It's slightly attenuated compared to wild type virus, but it still replicates very efficiently. So you can simply now, instead of a, a traditional plant production test where you use six or 12 more plates, you can now use micro neutralization plates. You can go down to 384 wells per plate. You can uh, seed those wells with, with cells like neuro cells are typically used. You can mix uh, some of this virus with a serum sample. And if, if the serum neutralizes the reporter virus, uh, it doesn't enter cells. The cells don't uh, express the reporter. And you don't get any change, either green or, or luciferase change in these cells. And you can measure this using an automated uh, imaging system very quickly. And you can do this assay in 16 hours instead of two to three days that it requires for SARS coronavirus 2 to make a plaque. So it cut down the time by about fourfold. It reduced the cost by probably about a hundredfold to do these assays. And so uh, the Pfizer company. Um, when they saw the results of this work, they contracted with DTMB to do all of the neutralization tests for their clinical trials. Moderna licensed the technology and did the same method for their trials. But uh, being able to do this high throughput uh, neutralization test, I think helped speed up the clinical trials by at least a few weeks and, and save a lot of money in doing that. Uh, the other uh, thing that I won't mention more about is that our campus was also a clinical trial site for both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And so we not only provided uh, uh, volunteers for the trials, a lot of scientists uh, like myself, except I was rejected. But my, <laughs> wife was a, my wife was at the Pfizer trial, and many of my colleagues were part of those trials. And it was a great feeling to feel like we could contribute both with the science and just with volunteering to allow the efficacy to be demonstrated for those vaccines. So um, the, the third uh, goal of this, so that, that reporter virus I just showed you is still a BSL-3 virus. It's only slightly attenuated. And we didn't think there was really uh, any chance that we could convince the authorities to work with it at lower containment. So all of those 20,000 uh, Pfizer neutralization tests were done in a BSL-3 lab with robotics and, uh, but still, uh, Working in BSL-3 is not optimal for high throughput and for uh, rapid speed. So we wanted to develop a lower biocontainment level for the virus. And the way that that was done was uh, taking the SARS-CoV-2 genome, and I'll, I'll show you here how it works. So here's the, uh, the genome here. Here's the uh, uh, nano uh, uh, GFP gene inserted for the reporter version. But you can take this genome and you can delete uh, a couple of the protein genes, like the envelope gene here and the non structural protein 3 here. So you delete those and the virus becomes replication deficient. Uh, so, what you can do then is you can take a separate uh, uh, clone that encodes only the third open reading frame uh, NS3 and only the envelope protein. And you can provide that in trans once you put the RNA from the uh, defective virus into cells, like I showed you before through electric operation. You add the complementary genes here, which allow this genome to replicate, to express the uh, reporter gene here, but it can't package, uh, uh, it can't recreate these two genes to package infectious virus. It only packages defective virus. So you can, you can produce a lot of virus with this defective genome, and then you can infect cells normally without the need for electroporation with those packaged defective RNAs. And you, they enter cells, they express the reporter, they light up the cell, green or yellow, whatever you want to use. And you can measure the same kind of uh, out, uh, endpoints like neutralization, 
or replication efficiency, anything you want. But now this virus is because it's replication defective, you can work with it at BSL2. We had to get permission from the National Institutes of Health that are run by a safety committee. We had to generate a lot of safety data, but uh, eventually we got permission to do that. And that allowed uh, the experimental work for the clinical trials to move into a lower containment level for even more efficiency. So uh, it was the BSL2 work that allowed uh, some of the later clinical trial samples to be done even more efficiently or Pfizer, and a lot of our later papers use this system. And uh, after a, a long time of working on this system and convincing the Food and Drug Administration, eventually, uh, just in February of this year, we got approval to move this uh, neutralization assay into our clinical hospital laboratory. As far as I know, this is the first uh, clinical lab in the world that could offer neutralization tests to patients who just want to find out their immune status. Maybe they're at high risk and they want to decide whether to get another booster or to take extra uh, safety measures. Uh, because neutralizing antibody tigers are still pretty good predictors of uh, protection, at least from severe disease. So this test is now available at BTMB uh, for anyone, theoretically, I guess, in the world who wants to know their antibody tiger. The next challenge that came along was when the variants began to appear. You probably remember this from about the middle of 2020 when uh, the first variants started to be described. Um, the ones that you may remember the best were beta, which really caused big public health problems, especially in Brazil. I would imagine that uh, variant may have been present in Colombia, at least for some time period. Uh, and alpha, which was another one of the very early ones. So uh, we felt that based on our uh, genetics experience and expertise, we wanted to contribute to understanding why these variants were occurring and what were the public health implications of all these variants. So uh, why do we care about variants? Well, we wanted to know if uh, uh, consistent with the epidemiologic data, we could show in a laboratory setting with animal models that the certain mutations were responsible for this increased transmissibility that the epidemiologists were seeing. Uh, we wanted to know if virulence was uh, affected by these mutations. Uh, that can also be done epidemiologically, but it takes a long time. And you know, you don't understand the mechanism if you just detect it through an epidemiologic study. And then probably most importantly, we wanted to know as quickly as possible where the these variants would resist immunity either from vaccination or prior infection, and whether we needed to think about developing new vaccines, new monoclonal antibody therapeutics, which were very important for the most severe infections, uh, the, the highest risk part of the population. So we set out uh, to, to study these new variants uh, beginning around March of 2020. And the first one to come along. Um, uh, uh, was uh, a variant that involved a single amino acid change uh, in, in the spike protein that uh, allowed the virus to be more transmissible. And uh, so here I just want to show you an example of some data that were produced um, as new variants came along. Uh, and the variants are listed over here on the left. And the serology that we did to determine whether they were resistant to current immunity. Now, ideally, what we would have done is a citizen new variant appeared somewhere in the world and there was evidence that it was spreading, we would get an isolate very quickly from that, uh, from that outbreak. And we would at least initially do traditional uh, neutralization assays. That would be the fastest way to go. But we found out, as we had in many past outbreaks, it's very hard to get virus strains from other parts of the world, sometimes even from other parts of the United States themselves. So uh, on average, I would say uh, it took us a month or two to get a new variant once it became clear that it was spreading and was probably going to reach the U.S. very quickly. So that just wasn't fast enough. So the way that we did this instead was uh, 
for each variant that came along, uh, we would we would mutate the original clone that we made from the Washington isolate made in January of 2020. We would put all the spike mutations, amino acid coding mutations of the new variant into our clone and we'd use that as a surrogate for the new variant. We could do that within since we saw the sequence and we, we knew there was reliable information of spread, we could do that within a couple of weeks. And then we could test these chimeric viruses for neutralizing ability. And so these are, are different uh, examples of variants that were cloned into the reverse genetic system uh, and to make uh, different uh, uh, surrogate variants for this kind of testing. And this allowed us, uh, each time a new variant came along, to very quickly assess uh, the neutralization capability of patient sera. We still had patients from the Pfizer study, and we had sera from people also vaccinated with the other main vaccines and from natural infections in Galveston. And we could very quickly assess the ability of those sera to neutralize the new variants. And uh, we, but we also wanted to understand uh, transmissibility, like I mentioned before. And so we started this uh, work around March of 2020 when this first mutation uh, got our attention. This is aspartic acid to glycine at position 614 in the spike gene. And uh, it was very clear that this mutation was spreading rapidly. And in fact, within about six months of when we started this project, every sequence being deposited into the international databases was the derived glycine version. But we wanted to test this experimentally. And then when the alpha variant came along, we wanted to test all of the spike mutations. In this case, there were eight of them, which became much more complicated. But uh, so I'm not gonna uh, show you any data from the first mutation, but the way that we did all of these was to take the Washington clone and put each of those uh, spike mutations into the clone, as well as combinations or all of the mutations together, and look at those viruses using an animal model. Now, the best model to use would have probably been a cat, but these studies require lots of animals. It would be impossible to work with non primates. During the COVID outbreak, they also became in very short supply and very expensive. Right now, to buy a cat in the United States is about 30,000 US dollars. So you can't do much with the CACs anymore. But the best road model in our opinion was the Syrian golden hamster. And the reason we used hamsters was because um, wild type strains of the virus uh, efficiently infect hamsters. The pathogenesis is very similar to what happens in humans. They infect the upper respiratory rec, uh, tract, but also the lungs, they produce histopathologic changes in the lungs, very similar to what's seen in people. They lose weight, but they don't generally die as people don't either. And so we've, uh, we've really uh, ex extensively used the hamster model for these kind of studies. So we've used them not only to look at tissue tropism, viral loads in the animals, but also transmission within a cage of multiple animals. Uh, but, um, what we found when we started looking at individual mutations, and these are the individuals listed down here, that if we would just, for example, compare one of these mutations, the one that turned out to be the most important was asparagine the tyrosine at 501. But if we just made this mutant and infected 10 hamsters, uh, harvested different parts of the respiratory tract, nasal washes to, to measure what they're shedding, and then compared it with the, the original Washington strain, we could often see a difference, but it wasn't significant. There's not a lot of power to see uh, the effect of these mutations when you simply infect some animals with one strain, other animals with a different strain. But uh, what we had learned a long time ago with studies of arboviruses that I'm gonna show you tomorrow, I'm gonna show you in more detail how these uh, assays work is, that you can get much better sensitivity and power to see the effect of an individual mutation. When you don't use some animals with one and others with the other, you allow them to compete in the same animal for replication and transmission. And then uh, you eliminate a lot of the variables, the animal to animal variable, 
that perhaps the stock to stock variable of the buyer strain you're working with. And uh, when you measure the winner of that competition, you have a lot more power to detect smaller differences. And I'll explain this graph more to you tomorrow, but what we see is this line one means that there was no change from the ratio of the virus that was inoculated into the animal compared to what was harvested from the animal. So that means there's no effect of the mutation at all. So you can see most of these uh, mutations had no significant effect, but this 501 mutation very consistently had a major effect when we uh, tested nasal washes, for example, both from the animal that was inoculated and an animal that received the virus through transmission in the cage. And we felt that there was an advantage both for infection of the upper respiratory tract of the hamster that led to increased efficiency of transmission. So uh, we learned uh, through these studies that this 501 mutation, which is now found in a lot of other variants as well, was very important. And this allowed us to, uh, at least um, when additional variants came along, we could at least look for this one and know it was probably very important in the uh, emergence of additional variants in different parts of the world. Uh, and, and in, in uh, contrast, most of these other mutations, we could not show any effect at all with phenotypes. So we could at least not focus our, uh, our future continuing work on these mutations if they were found in other parts of the world. Now, uh, the alpha variant uh, that I've shown you data from here had eight spike mutations. So we had to do a lot of animal work, a lot of different experiments to test each of those individually. You probably know that the current variants, the Omicron variants, have several times more than eight. They've got many dozens of mutations. So uh, about two years ago, we quickly realized we were not going to be able to keep up with all these variants. It was simply impossible to do all the cloning, let alone all the animal work. So we've, uh, we've tested a few mutations that there's other evidence might be important for transmission, but we haven't been able to systematically test every mutation in the spike of every variant as the outbreak has, and the new variants have continued to emerge. Less again, um, so the other thing that we did, um, our physicians in our hospital, we had a lot of COVID. Um, they really needed information on what variant was infecting their patients. And that was principally because there were good monoclonal antibody ther therapies available. But it was discovered very quickly that some of the variants completely resisted the ability of those monoclonal antibodies to neutralize the virus. So they were worthless clinically. So we set up a, a screening system in our hospital where we would take a random sample of about 10% of our COVID positive uh, nasal swab samples submitted to our laboratory for PCR testing. We take a random sample of those each week and sequence the spike gene. And we would report within a couple of days to our clinicians what we felt was infecting most of the patients. We would also take samples on an, uh, an as requested basis that the clinician really felt it was critical that they know if this antibody is going to be effective in the patient. We would sequence individuals that we were referred to by our clinicians. And so we, we developed data like this. I'm sure you've seen this on a global scale, probably on a Colombian scale and maybe local scale here. As the variants continued to come through Galveston, we were at least able to tell our clinicians what they were facing in our hospital during this time. And we also use this screening program to, to do some interesting epidemiologic work locally in Galveston. So this is the example that uh, I thought was the most interesting. And that was in the summer of 2021, uh, there was a, a summer camp for children in Galveston County near our campus uh, where there was an outbreak of COVID. And uh, there were 186 PCR confirmed cases out of 451 persons, mostly children, but some adults who were supervising them in this camp. And so we were able to take the samples from our clinical lab, the residual testing for PCR samples, the nasal swabs, and sequence most of these and do phylogenetics. And first of all, we discovered that 
It was probably a single point source introduction, a single camper that brought the virus with them, and it spread very quickly throughout the population. Uh, we we uh, determined that vaccinated campers only had a 13% attack rate, under uh, unvaccinated on almost a half of them uh, infected symptomatically. And then when these campers went home, uh, about half of them transmitted to members of their household. And so the, this strain spread into the community very quickly. Uh, this also occurred at a, a much higher frequency in unvaccinated household members than vaccinated. And also there was an association between wearing masks at home and a lower chance of transmission in the household. And so uh, we felt that this wasn't certainly the first evidence of efficacy of vaccine vaccination or masking, but it added in a real-time setting uh, the importance of these two public health measures. Um, and then the, the, the last examples I wanna show you are, are from a program that was set up by the National Institutes of Health. I mentioned earlier, there were some big problems with the Centers for Disease Control in the US. And really the CDC took a beating throughout the pandemic for various, uh, uh, say suboptimal responses. But the NIH, in my opinion, did pretty well responding to the outbreak. And one of the things it did was set up this program called SARS CoV 2 Assessment of Viral Evolution, or SAVE. And so, like everybody else, the NIH wanted to be able to predict what was coming next and what, what were the challenges and what we could do to mitigate the future risks. And so, what they did was they set up uh, informal committees of scientists from around the world. I'd say more than half were from the U.S., but many were from other parts of the world who, who had expertise in several different areas. So uh, the first one was in analyzing the sequences. You know, there are millions of sequences now in the international database. Someone like me can't easily digest all that, but there were experts who could look at what was coming into the database week after week was there evidence of spreading? Were the mutations in parts of proteins that were expected to affect spreading, resistance to immunity, all these kinds of things. So these were informatics specialists. Then there was an in vitro group that did things like uh, looking at antibody assays with new variants to see if immunity was going to be affected. The one that we mainly participated in was called the in vivo characterization group. And this group um, was people mainly working with mice and hamsters, a few people with not even primates. But we were tasked by the NIH to do a number of different studies related to vaccine efficacy. And then all of this information fed into something we call the interagency group, which was uh, the Food and Drug Administration, the NIH, the CDC, all coming together to make national decisions. And so I'm just going to show you. Uh, the most recent work we did as part of the state program. So we, we were assigned by the NIH and given funding uh, based on our experience with hamsters and vaccine testing. And uh, they split up the workload among different universities and they assigned us principally to test vaccination with the Johnson & Johnson adenoviral vaccine. Um, and then to later on look at the effect of different boosters on maintaining immunity and protection in this model. And it, it turned out that not long after we got this assignment, um, because of the data accumulating on very small risk, a significant risk for cardiovascular adverse outcomes in people who received the Johnson Johnson vaccine, the, the Centers for Disease Control actually recommended that that vaccine not be given to most people. So we were pretty disappointed because all of a sudden we were tasked with the vaccine that wasn't going to be used much anymore. But nevertheless, we finished the work uh, a few months ago and uh, just showing you a little bit about the work that we did. So we used the hamster model um, and we started this work uh, way back in early uh, 2022. We began vaccinating hamsters primarily um, with the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the company would not give us this vaccine. So what we had to do was we would go to our clinics at the end of each afternoon where they were administering this vaccine and we would ask them, we would beg them for the leftover vaccine. Usually they had one or two vials 
And we would take those back to our lab and we would put them in the minus 80 freezer. And we actually tested the effect of an extra freeze thaw on immunogenicity, and we could see no difference. So we were able to stockpile vaccines in our freezer until we did an animal experiment, we would combine them and use them. So the animals were vaccinated. Uh, we also did a few with this is the Pfizer mRNA vaccine as a control. And then we would we would wait a long time, at least six months, and then boost them with another vaccine. Very, very few groups in the world uh, did these longitudinal long-term studies where they were had the patients or the funding to wait many months to boost. But, but this was part of our mission. So then we gave them different kinds of boosters. Um, this is the Moderna bivalent vaccine that includes the original Wuhan or Washington strain, along with a, an Omicron variant that they mix together in equal proportions. This is a Novavax uh, express protein vaccine that was developed uh, later on, a couple of years behind the others, but it's available now in many parts of the world. And then this is the same Johnson & Johnson vaccine here. So we would boost these animals after many months, we would measure their antibody response throughout the process. Then we would infect them intranasally and look at the distribution of virus throughout the respiratory tract, and including the lungs and, and the nasal washes here. And just to show you a few of the data as an example. So this is a comparison of animals that received either a high dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or a low dose, 100 fold less here, or the Pfizer vaccine. And these are similar uh, proportions compared to a human dose of each of these vaccines, about one tenth of a human dose, which is still a lot for a small animal like a hamster. And this is a big problem in the field. We don't know how to optimize the dose for mice or hamsters to get the same immunogenicity as we see in humans. But we use these doses based on what have been done in earlier studies. Uh, and then we looked at uh, neutralizing the antibody titers. And you can see here that uh, after especially the high dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, well, the antibody titers were very good and they were very stable way out to about nine months here. The titer only dropped uh, by about 20 to 40 fold here. Uh, with the low dose, the titers are a little bit lower at the peak, also a slow drop. But look at here what happens with two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. The initial titers are lower, and then the stability is much lower. And this has been seen with all the mRNA vaccines. And it's really a shame that this Johnson & Johnson vaccine got this reputation uh, for a very low risk uh, of reverse outcomes because it's a very good one-dose vaccine in our hands with these experiments. Uh, and then uh, these data down here are just uh, binding uh, ELISA titers, which show the same kind of pattern here. Lack of stability with two doses of mRNA. Very good stability, especially with a high dose of the, the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And then this is a very busy slide. I'm sure you can't read, but I just want to point out a few features. So this is what happened after we did the boosters. So we, we took those animals, we boosted them with those uh, four different variations that I showed you before. And then we challenged them with uh, the initial Omicron isolate. And uh, we looked at different outcomes, such as virus titers in nasal washes in the trachea or in the lungs. So upper or lower respiratory tract. And so, um, first of all, shown here are the initial uh, uh, levels of virus after the single vaccination of the Johnson & Johnson, which are pretty good. Uh, I think reflected really pretty well as I showed you in the antibody responses. Uh, but when we did the boosters, all the boosters uh, had some impact. But we were a little bit surprised that in general, what we saw was the Novavax booster shown here um, seemed to be the most efficient booster of all of these. The mRNA boosting uh, had some impact, but not a lot. And I think that probably the, the, the lines I'm pointing to here are after the animals received two doses of the Pfizer mRNA vaccine. This Novavax booster worked very well. And, uh, we're hoping that the paper on this work will be out in a few weeks, and maybe the, the US government, the Food and Drug Administration, will consider promoting Novavax more as a booster. 
Because if, if I were to decide tomorrow what booster I want, I would go for Novavax. I think that the combination of mRNA followed by protein probably works quite well. So I always end up when I talk about the reference center um, uh, with this slide here, we need your help. So we're here to help you. I'm sure that um, we have helped a few of you over the years with your research. But the value of the reference center depends on us getting new strains of arboviruses and emerging viruses from places like Columbia, which are very important for so many. So if you're doing any kind of uh, research, especially with patients or field work, and you find uh, zoonotic viruses in your samples, please consider donating them to the reference center. We'll cover all the costs, we'll do all the paperwork for you. And you'll be contributing to international efforts to control these uh, emerging zoonotic viruses. And also, uh, if you're in need of training, uh, we you know, one of our main missions is to train scientists from all, all parts of the world, and we're very happy to talk to you about what we can offer you. So, uh, and last but not least, these are the two people who run the reference center: Drs. Ken and Jessica Plant. Um, this is John Yin Lu, who did a lot of the uh, reverse genetics COVID work to show which mutations were increasing upper airway infection and transmission. Uh, but the two other groups we worked with most closely were the group of Aok Shi. They did uh, all the major cloning and a lot of the reverse genetics work, along with Anit Madhuri, who's one of our card carrying coronavirologists. He, uh, he did his postdoc with a guy named Ralph Barrett who studied SARS-CoV-1 since uh, 2002, and uh, he's been extremely productive, and it's been a great collaboration with all these people. So if there are any uh, questions, I'm glad to try to answer them for you. First, thank you for your presentation. I, I think it was great. I have a bunch of questions, but I would just uh, like to, to pose two for you, if that's okay. The first one is uh, both are about your, your eight joints, one of the, the studies, the, the last study that you showed, the one of uh, the booster immunity. Uh, my question is if you, whether or not uh, checked on maybe the safety as well, that it had. These animal models, due to the fact that, as you mentioned, the main concern for withdrawing uh, in, in part this is an antivirus based vaccine was based on safety concerns. Well, we didn't do any experiments that were specifically designed to look at safety of these vaccines. Um, when we did this study, when we started with the initial vaccinations, we had about 350 or 400 animals that were sitting for six months waiting their boosters. Um, we didn't detect any disease in any of those animals, including the ones that got Johnson & Johnson, which there were about 300 of those. But we didn't have match controls. Um, we didn't do anything detailed other than to weigh them periodically and then to obtain blood samples and look at their antibody responses. So. Um, we certainly were not in a position to look at their cardiac function. We didn't do anything to try to image the heart or uh, the kinds of studies that would have been useful, but it simply wasn't part of our task. We were, um, we were given pretty strict guidance by the NIH what they wanted us to do. So I can't say that we, uh, we really added to any data either for or against the safety of that vaccine. Thank you. And, and the other question that I had on the same study was um, that I was shocked when you showed uh, the results of boosting after uh, with, with a known Vax vaccine versus the mRNA based vaccines. Because uh, what, we, what we have been shown before, and specifically in, in, um, like in, in real life studies, was that mRNA was like the best vaccine available. So I was a bit shocked. Now. Uh, and I wanted to know maybe your perspective yeah. as to why this could be happening. Sure. Well, first of all, I, I don't want to mislead you to think that mRNA boosters are not good because um, I didn't show you the data, but all of those boosters help protect against weight loss in the hamsters. Um, 
and the, the, it's completely consistent with humans. When we're boosted, we have less risk of lung disease um, leading to weight loss and disease manifestations and so forth. But it doesn't protect us very well against upper airway infection and transmission. And that's, that's the weakness of all those vaccines. We can't control transmission very well with them. But, um, but I think that um, um, but um, I'm sorry, I think I've forgotten the first part of your question, but uh, maybe the, the why you think that this no why it works vaccine. better. Yeah. Well, I, I think that this is a very immunogenic vaccine. We did not test it as a primary vaccination, but it works quite well. And I, I think that um, uh, I'm not an immunologist, but I think that there are other vaccine studies combining different prime and boost combinations where uh, mRNA followed by protein often works better than protein followed by mRNA, for example. So I don't think there are great data on that for SARS-CoV-2, but for other vaccines, there are better data. And often they call, what they're called heterologous prime boosts work better than homologous. So that, that's really, I, I can only speculate uh, beyond that. Why we did just the, the side of that vaccine? Well, I don't even know how I would have gotten that vaccine in the US. It's never been used. Um, I would have had to have written to the company or had a collaborator who was vaccinating people in another part of the world. So We've never worked with any inactivated vaccines for COVID. Um, you know, I think that there's there's pretty good data from many different places that it's just not very antigenic. Um, inactivated vaccines, I'm sure you know, have been very successful for some viral diseases, but for for SARS-CoV-2, they just don't seem to be as effective. Again, uh, yeah, I'm not an immunologist. I can only speculate why that is. Um, but, you know, I think the politics probably did get mixed up in this a little bit. You know, I, uh, unfortunately, probably more in the United States than anywhere in the world, politics worked its way into science, and uh, it, I think it even influenced uh, the thinking of scientists a little bit along the way. For example, where did COVID come from? Some U.S. scientists were too quick to rule out. The possibility that it came from a laboratory or something like that. But uh, I think we were also very close minded to inactivated vaccines. And because none of the US companies developed them, and because there's this anti China sentiment in the country, uh, I don't know of anybody in the US who worked with that vaccine. It's just too bad. Can I wait? And then variants, and just adding the nuclear protein, you know, just left for it to serve, 
and the spike gene, we got a much broader protection from that, that mRNA with, with two different genes. So, and I'm not at all surprised uh, to learn that an inactivated vaccine has a booster that work very well on the Same way that the uh, Novavax protein subunit vaccine seems to work very well for us. So, I, uh, all, all I can comment on is what's been published. At least in, for the initial two doses of the inactivated vaccine in some parts of the world, it performed very poorly. Uh, I'm just curious about it. Do um, you know about the regular in the coming two patients, the current two patients, the vaccine, and there's a variance and media data, and how many people are responding to a booster? And boosters, and because here it seems a little surprising to me that now they're in a totally different place that they want to experience before. For person like me, like biology, that we don't want to watch on the, the pandemic. So it seems like uh, nothing ever happened. You know, like people don't yeah. believe anymore in vaccines, or they don't want to be vaccinated yeah. anymore. In the, well, I think in, in the U.S., probably starting about a year ago, uh, even people who believe in vaccines and were vaccinated as soon as possible, they started to develop what we call uh, COVID vaccine fatigue. Um, they just didn't, didn't continue getting boosted. And especially last fall, when this new bivalent uh, RNA vaccine started to become available for boosters, only about 10 to 20% of the population ever got those boosters. And, um, so I think we've reached a point in the U.S. where people, they don't care about COVID anymore. You know, take their chances with getting infected. Um, you know, the herd immunity in the country is probably at least 90 percent. Uh, so there are still a few people who were never vaccinated and they get infected and they die in our hospitals. It's about 300 every day in the U.S. But other than those people, uh, COVID is just not having a big public health impact anymore. The emergency government measures are over now. You can't get free testing or free vaccination anymore. Um, and so uh, if you come to the U.S., it probably looks pretty much like it did in 2019. You see a few people wearing masks, but not very many. And um, you know, I, I'm still going to keep getting boosted um, because I think it does offer a little extra protection against, you know, hopefully, uh, I got COVID once after three doses. Uh, it was like a very mild common cold for me. Hopefully, I can keep it like that if I keep giving you get the boosters. But other people with boosters have much more serious disease, not hospitalized disease, but stay home for a week, feel awful, mm -hmm. and disease, even if they uh, receive two boosters or more. So, we still don't understand the correlates of protection very well, but it's clear that the, um, the vaccination and boosters preventing hospitalization and life-threatening COVID. The other thing that uh, another result we just got um, about two weeks ago, um, this collaborative group that I work with, uh, you know that the bivalent boost mRNA boosters have been disappointing. They don't work any better than a booster with the original strain of virus. And everybody's been a little bit puzzled about this because they should, they should work a little bit better at least. And it turns out that there's a mutation in the Omicron spike that uh, reduces the overall expression of the spike protein, either when cells are infected with the virus, but even if you just put, uh, if you transfect cells with a plasmid expressing only the spike, that Omicron spike is produced at less than half of the level that the original spike or all the earlier variants is going to do. So it seems like unknowingly, um, we made bivalent vaccines with the second spike um, being less immunogenic from the mRNA than the initial spike. And that's probably part of the reason, at least that these bivalent um, boosters haven't worked so long. And it's another reason why the protein booster may, may be working better than what I showed you for the Moderna vaccine, which has this lower expression spike plus the original spike in the MRI. Um, 
Influenza. There are always going to be pandemics of influenza. Hopefully, the next time it'll be another H1N1 or H3N2 that will be just another seasonal strain that sweeps around the world, infects everybody, but doesn't kill a lot more people than typical seasonal flu that we always have. But you know, it could be something much more serious, um, like H5N1. You know, we still, um, thanks in part to concerns of gain of function research, which we could talk a long time about. It's a big topic of discussion in the US, but um, you know, some experiments were done about 15 years ago to try to understand the risk that H5N1, um, that's highly virulent in people, almost a 50% case mortality rate that can become human to human transmissible. Uh, by uh, trying to do laboratory adaptations. One of those studies was in Wisconsin and the other in the Netherlands. And, um, they suggested there probably is some potential. That could happen tomorrow in Asia or it might not happen in a thousand years, we don't know. And you know, we have a huge outbreak of H5N1. It's not the same strain right now in the US that's uh, causing me to pay a lot of more money for eggs. A lot of chickens are being killed. Um, uh, whether that strain has the ability to become transmissible. We don't know, and it's very hard to not do experiments to try to assess the risk. Uh, I think there will be other coronaviruses, but maybe next time we'll be much better prepared. Uh, we'll know how to make vaccines very quickly, even faster than this time. Um, uh, but on, on, on the other hand, so I think we've learned a lot, a little bit from SARS-1, a lot from SARS-2, but on the other hand, I think it's going to be much harder now to do surveillance for bat coronaviruses. Um, I, I think you know, the U.S. Uh, National Institutes of Health is not going to fund that kind of research anymore because they've gotten a lot of criticism that they were indirectly funding research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And some people think that they may have had bat samples that had SARS-CoV-2. Maybe one of their scientists was infected without knowing it. Um, certainly there's evidence that they didn't have the best safety practices in that laboratory and that uh, a scientist that did know about an accident probably would not be willing to talk about it. So I think we're in a worse position right now as far as our ability to know what's in nature that may be the next, next risk for the next coronavirus pandemic. Um, but I think that, um, you know, it, it could have been a lot worse if you think about it. The SARS-CoV-1 uh, had a case fatality rate of about 10%. Uh, it spread to something like 17 countries. I think we were very lucky that it did become pandemic with much more mortality than SARS-CoV-2. And, you know, there's probably a lot of other coronaviruses out there uh, maybe more similar to SARS-CoV-1 or somewhere in the middle in their virulence. And future pandemic could be even worse. For arboviruses, um, I think my RO is, is certainly one that we have to keep an eye on um, because my RO, um, in, in my opinion, based on work done in our lab and other groups, um, it's on the verge of having the two key properties to become Pandemic. One is generating enough human viridia to infect Aedes aegypti, and the other is the susceptibility of Aedes aegypti to myr. The viremia seems like it's slightly lower than chikungunya, and the infectiousness for Aedes aegypti is slightly inferior. But uh, you know, again, they could myr find one or two mutations that would 
uh, lead it down that pathway like chikungunya, it's very possible. Um, there are probably other unknown arboviruses out there or barely known viruses like Zika was in 2012. That could be the next one to come along. Um, I suspect that there are not a whole lot more um, human infectious arboviruses that have not been identified because the next generation sequencing the metagenomics um, is being used in a lot of places to look at febrile human illness. And also, uh, I think another important place to look is in non-human primates. Most of these dangerous arboviruses are non-human primate viruses and probably have an, an easy time transitioning to primates in the forest to our kind of primates. Uh, certainly Zika and chikungunya did that very easily along with dengue. So I think doing surveillance in monkeys is very important and, uh, in places like Colombia and Brazil. Uh, those opportunities come along if they're if they're just uh, ecology studies going on, not even primates and samples are available. I think we ought to be looking at uh, samples to see if we're missing the uh, arboviruses or other zoonotic viruses like retroviruses. Even. Well, I think that's about as far as I can go without a beer or two. <laughs> uh, I mean, not related with that. I, I was recalling that you told me a collaboration point in Africa. Yeah, I thought there were. And I, a couple of years ago, I read that there is a new vaccine for Ebola. So I don't know if they are applying it there or how is it being tested and you know you could solve that information. Yeah, so we have a, a project in three parts of West Africa, Senegal, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria, where we're doing surveillance for emerging viral diseases. Um, we do a lot of uh, surveillance in hospitals and clinics for people who have acute febrile illness. But typically in that part of the world, they receive no diagnostics. The clinician probably does a malaria test and that's all that's available. So we, we apply a, a wide range of diagnostics to look for arboviruses, loss of fever, Ebola, all kinds of things. Um, and this is the part of the world where the major 2014 Ebola outbreak occurred. Um, more than 10 times bigger than any previous Ebola outbreak. We had local transmission right in the state of Texas when a traveler came to the hospital in Dallas and nurses were infected. So uh, filoviruses have um, gone from not really our concern. There are some remote villages in Africa. We don't need to worry about them being serious concerns now. Uh, there is a vaccine that was developed right at the end of that big epidemic. It was tested uh, when the epidemic was already starting to wane, but still there were cases occurring. And using a little bit different kind of strategy to show efficacy, it, that vaccine was proven to be efficacious against infection. Uh, but it's not being widely used. If you, uh, if you live in uh, uh, Sierra Leone right now, you can't just go down the street to a clinic and ask to be vaccinated for Ebola. It's really mainly used for outbreak control. So, it's been used in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, there were some other recent cases in, in West Africa, including recrudescent infections of people who were infected in 2014, and then they became uh, myremic again in 2022, I believe it was. So we have to worry now about recrudescent infections initiated in an outbreak. But that vaccine, um, simply isn't widely available. It's not produced in large quantities. And the other big factor is that it's only effective against the Zaire strain or species. So the recent outbreak in, in Ethiopia, for example, it's not effective against the Sudan strain. There are other similar vaccines that are uh, at late stage of preclinical development that have been used on an emergency basis. Um, and then Marburg, has also popped up in West Africa for the first time. And like the Sudan and Ebola outbreaks, there's no vaccine that's been approved for even emergency human use. Um, so we're still vulnerable to filoviruses for sure. Although I think we, you know, we know how to make vaccines um, that will be effective. There's just, there's not a big market for them. Um, you know, these vaccines, if they, if they were to control a disease in the US, they would cost probably three or four hundred dollars 
uh, you know, that's not going to happen in West Africa. So the, the business plan is not well developed for how these vaccines will be produced. I think what hopefully will happen in the future is local companies and places like Senegal, where they have a new company and a new factory they're building right now, will start making vaccines like that for use in Africa. Um, this facility in Senegal, where I work, was developed because it took so long for any vaccine for COVID to become available in Africa. And Africans learned the hard way. They cannot rely on the United States or Europe to take care of them during a pandemic. They have to look out for themselves. So it's, it's an unfortunate reality of you know, the world we live in, and the, the uh, financial uh, forces at play when these pandemics occur.